Do you know how hard it is to create or make? A, there we go. Oh gosh. Uh, I have something turned on. Hold on a second. Oh, there we go. There we go. Oh man. I leave one of my tabs open to my actual stream. And then a few seconds later, I'm like getting the, the, uh, the repeat back. Oh, that's a little embarrassing. Um, this is uh, Theologica, so we call it The Study. My name is Joseph Louthan. Uh, welcome to the Bible Study in Romans. Uh, we have the, the noon, high noon time, uh, central time, Mondays, uh, every Monday. Uh, this is really at the request, the reason why we have such a, uh, an odd time. Maybe it's odd. Because a lot of streamers do, let me slow down, a lot of streamers do, do their streaming after work. I do mine's on my lunchtime for today. And the reason why is I have, I'm doing this uh, at the request of some of my friends in uh, Kenya. So Alex, if you're hearing, uh, you and your fam and your uh, any of your friends are listening, how you doing? Um, today we're gonna get into it. Uh, I have no other announcements other than we're gonna just pop right into it. My camera is weird and off, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to open us up in prayer. Uh, Father God, we thank you so much for this time and day. We thank you for that uh, your gift of your word uh, that without it, we wouldn't know who you are. We wouldn't know the, your nature, your divine. You, we wouldn't know any of that. Uh, and it came in the fullest revelation of your son, Jesus Christ. When he set foot on this earth, we, we got to see you. We saw you. Um, you are forever the invisible God, uh, but because of your son uh, appearing in the flesh, uh, we set our eyes, our affections, our hope upon you because of your son. And... We do this not in our own power, but we do this in your power. We do this in your spirit, your Holy Spirit that you have uh, given to every person who believes and trusts in you. So we love you. We thank you. We praise you for today. And then we pray this in your son's name. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let's go. We're going to do Romans 1, 13 through 15. I will. I have all week to make this announcement, but here's here's there's a little scheduling thing. Next week, I'm out of town. I'm not going to be uh, streaming, not even from the remote parts. I'm going to be somewhere in the woods. Uh, so that may not happen. I'm not going to bring all my equipment. Also, part of that traveling is that this Friday, the Family Devotions Day, we are, um, I need to do, a part, I won't live stream that because I will be traveling on that day. And um, uh, so I may do the recording. I will do the recording before schedule it for like Friday morning and uh, it'll be at YouTube and podcast, just not Twitch. So uh, stay tuned now. Okay. So I have vacation next week. I'm going to be in the middle of the woods. When I come back Memorial day weekend, we're going to, I'm praying about this, but my mind is made up. Um, I'm going to go switch to streaming five days a week. So my schedule is going to be in home Bible study, sunny evening. I'm going to pair that up. I'm going to actually do a light dinner with that. So if you're in the Norman, Oklahoma City area, come by Sunday nights. Uh, just hit me up for details on that. Uh, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, it's all stream, baby. Uh, I'm going to do probably in, in more, um, I, this is what I probably will do. I might stream twice a day on Mondays and then like have a steady stream Monday, Tuesday, like do the stream on Mondays at noon and do, do the exact same stream um, on Mondays on five. Okay. So we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at 5 PM. And the, now what I will stream that I'm still kind of settling on the schedule, but here's what I'm trying to work out. Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays will be Romans. So that, instead of like finishing up in 2023 at this rate, 
uh, probably going to finish up sometime in October, November. Uh, and then let's do uh, Tuesdays with, um, excuse me, with pastoral epistles. And then Thursdays, let's go family devotions. So uh, we're going to keep this on, keep it on. I do not stream on my Sabbath, which is Friday, starts at right after the, the Friday stream and ends on Saturday evening. So I don't, I don't work on those days. Um, anyway, there it is. Uh, so let's just go right into it. Something I've noticed, uh, when I go, I have written, and if you're, if you're looking here, clicking on the website, so you're at theologic.us, and then you click, you look at the series, like I have, I have tons of stuff written here. I have tons of stuff written here. So this is all my preparatory work for this stream. Uh, so we have Bible, uh, Romans, uh, Bible study in Romans, and uh, I'm really liking the format, really uh, keep it on with that. But, so I've written this stuff out like earlier this year, like at the beginning of the year. I just had this thought. It's like, what if I just did a Bible study, right? Uh, I do a Bible study and in this format and kind of loosely based on family devotions, on meditations and all that, but really getting to the meat and the, uh, the, just the meat of what a Bible study should be about. And also I, I was attempting to write a commentary, which didn't really pan. I got through Romans one. And I was just like, man, I was losing steam. This Bible study series is really to help me and equip me to write a commentary later on. And so all I have to say is like, you know, I've written all my notes out and you're looking at the notes, but then on the day of, or a day, maybe a day prior to, I'm praying through, I'm preparatory, I am preparing and I'm looking. And, um, when I read it through, sometimes like I'll look at like how my, my thoughts transition from one thought to the other. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense unless I interject every line from the passage that we're studying. And right, if we you read this yesterday, 24 hours ago, this would not have made sense. But then I was like, why am I transitioning like that? It's because of the text, staying faithful to the text. So here we go. Romans 1, 13 through 15. Now, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I often planned to come to you, but was prevented until now in order that I might have a fruitful ministry among you just as I have had among the rest of the Gentiles. I am obligated both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Now let's go, let's take this text line by line. Let's look at the support for the text. So first off, uh, that would be, I think, verse 13. I don't have the numbers in there. So I, I think it's like, I think it's verse 13. Now, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I have often planned to come to you, but was prevented until now in order that I might have a fruitful ministering among you, just as I have had among the rest of the Gentiles. Where So point number one, where we live and minister and proclaim Christ is on God's sovereign grace. Acts 17, 24 through 29. The, the God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by hands, neither is he served by human hands, although he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man he has made every nationality to live all over the earth and determine their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And even some of you, your own poets, have said we are his offspring. Since then we are God's offspring, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. There are so much to pull away from that passage the main point i want to show that in that passage is that looking at i think it's uh about verse 27 for one man he has made every nationality 
to live all over the earth and determine the appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him. Hey, you know what? Guess what? What it was? A, what is the thing I'm going to keep mentioning every single time you get on the stream? You are commissioned by Jesus Christ, your Lord, my Lord, your Savior, my Savior, to go and proclaim the gospel to all of creation, to the ends of the earth. Go and raising up disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded. That's your commission. That's what you go get to do, and you get to be obedient in that. Now, here's a real kick, is that even in the times that we live in, even in uh, uh, the, the travel is not even, well, okay, we're just coming out of a pandemic, got God's grace, uh, but even still, travel is pretty much a breeze, and I get beat down by air travel. I actually travel uh, for a living. Uh, previous to pandemic, I was out like five days a week and traveled, man, it beats me. But you know what? The I can drive for 12 hours or I can fly for four. There's no comparison to that. I can actually go to the other side of the world. In and so much as even that we do have the ability to travel, don't neglect where your home address is right now. My, I submit to you, if this is true and God is sovereign, which is also true, and he is gracious, which is also true, that where you live, that determines where you're going to minister. You are put there so that your neighbors, your coworkers, your, your fellow students, your any, anybody that you come across in your day-to-day -day walks, your the, your favorite coffee shops, your favorite diners, your favorite restaurants, the the grocery stores that you live at, that that's all. That is not a mistake. That was not a coincidence. That was set there by God. God has commissioned you to go and tell the good news, but then He puts you in those certain neighborhoods. Why? For His glory, so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out to find Him. Now, it's not. I know you can read that and be like, oh, yeah, uh, Joe Bob, who lives on the other side of town, you know, he doesn't know God, but he's there because uh, he might seek after God. That's what the passage means. No, no. There's somebody who lives in his neighborhood that God has placed there who loves the Lord. And God has told him, hey, share that with Joe Bob, who lives on the other side of town, so that they might seek God. So whatever that looks like, I don't care if you're introverted or extroverted, whatever. You got to do it one-on-one. -on -one, you got to do it one-on-a million, whatever the case may be. Just be obedient. Just go after God. That's the point. Okay. Verse number two. I'm obligated to both the Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and foolish. In other words, we don't get, oh man, this is controversial, uh, especially in our time. Uh, but if I'm going to put it this way. If you live because he has set your neighbors, and we know the story of the Good Samaritan, we know the parable of Good Samaritan, so everybody's our neighbor, but especially in the places that you live, your coworkers are your neighbors, your fellow students are your neighbors, your neighbors are your neighbors, uh, all the above, right? Your family members, like you live in the same town as your family members, you live in the same zip code, the area code, that's, that's God. How are you going to minister to them? How are you going to tell them about tell them the good news of Christ. You believe and trust in him, all your sins get put on him. You want to keep some of your sins? That doesn't work that way. That's not how that works. But he's a big and beautiful enough savior to take that thing that's from you, that's crippling you, that's breaking your back. And if you don't want to admit it or not, that's fine. But he's there. God is there. Now, what I love about this passage is the opening to Romans is the pretty much the mirror of the closing of Romans. So we're going to jump ahead. Spoiler alert, Romans 15, 14 through 21. My brothers and sisters, I myself am convinced about you that you're also full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. Never, never, nevertheless, I have written to remind you more boldly on some points because of the grace given to me 
by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, serving as a priest of the gospel of God. God's purpose is that the Gentiles may be an acceptable offering sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to boast in Christ Jesus regarding what pertains to God. For I dare not say anything except what Christ has accomplished through me by word and deed. Watch this. By word and deed for the obedience of the Gentiles, one, by the power of miraculous signs and wonders, two, and by the power of God's Spirit, three. As a result, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ from Jerusalem all the way around to Illocrum. My aim is to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named so that I will not build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who are not told about him will see and those who, who have not heard will understand. We are obligated. If Paul is obligated, we're no less obligated. We are obligated to go and carry this. This is, this is God's sovereign grace upon us. Okay? Now. <clears throat> How do you like that mute action? Now, what does the passage say about God? How what, what have we been mentioning this entire time? Well, let me put it, let me flip it in another way. Remember, I'm gonna scroll back up. Look at this. Now, I don't want you look at what Paul's saying. Now, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I often planned to come to you, but was prevented until now. What prevented him to go into going to Rome? What prevented Paul from going to Rome? Was it circumstances? Life? Did he not raise enough support? Hmm. hmm. I want to, I submit to you, listener and reader, that it's not circumstances, but it was God who is sovereign. I do want to touch on, it's going to sound like it's going to be off topic. It's not off topic. I really in this passage, this little short little passage, and the reason why I didn't go on and just talk about Romans 1, 16 and 17, which if you're excited about, you know, what's coming up, I'm equally excited, but we're not going to get there yet. That's going to be two weeks, two weeks. The drama is uh, building on that. What is the sovereignty of God, though? So I'm going to read this in dealing with. With trying to wrap our minds around God's sovereignty, uh, um, I'm going to take this quote, 19th century Presbyterian theologian named Charles Hodge laid out the sovereignty of God. I think it's 19th century. You might, I might have those dates right. But anyway, there's, there is a theologian from Princeton named Charles Hodge who wrote a three volume uh, systematic theology where he I caught, this is how I got a hold of this quote, uh, this idea of like, what is really God's sovereignty? Is, is God's sovereignty is like, oh yeah, that's an attribute of God. Like, uh, God is good. God is love. God is holy. God is sovereign. Check, check, check. Actually, it was something in the way that Charles Hodge in his, in the theology volume, I think it's volume one, theology uh, in the way he laid out his table of contents, he, the way he laid that out was to suggest that he declared that he, God's sovereignty was based out of the power of God, not necessarily a divine attribute. So we're not trying to say, Charles, Mr. Hodge was not trying to say God is not sovereign. Don't, don't mistake what he is saying. But it's because he is all these things that we aforementioned. God is good. God is holy. God is love. God is merciful. God is grace. God is peace. God is just. God is righteous. So on and so forth. It's because God is fully maxed out, fully perfect in all those attributes. He gets to be holy. It's, I don't want to misspeak, but I, it's, it's, it's a... It's because of those perfections, God is sovereign. I don't, I don't want to call it a side effect because it's a, not a mere side effect. Um, sovereignty, God, and this is what Hodge writes. To that end, God, Hodge writes this in his systematic theology. Sovereignty is not a property of the divine nature, but a prerogative arising out of the perfections of a supreme being. In other words, God is not sovereign because he is sovereign. Let me... let. Let me let Hodge explain this. Although this sovereignty is thus universal and absolute, it is the sovereignty 
of wisdom, holiness, and love. The authority of God is limited by nothing out of himself, but it is controlled in all its manifestations by his infinite perfections. If, and this is where the point comes, how does, what does that matter with me? Check this out. If a man is free and exalted in proportion as he is governed by the enlightened reason and pure conscience, so he is supremely blessed who is cheerfully submits to be governed by the infinite wisdom and holiness of God. This sovereignty of God is the ground of peace and confidence to all his people. They rejoice that the Lord God omnipotent went reigns that neither necessity nor chance nor the folly of man nor the malice of satan controls the sequence of events and all their issues infinite wisdom love power belong to god our great god and savior alone into whose hands all power in heaven and earth have been committed I love that quote. It's very wordy, and it's also 19th century. It's also Princeton, but it's once you, I, when I finally wrapped my head around it, I was like, "Oh man," because he is perfect in everything God says he is. Out of that comes sovereignty. I get to rest as a finite mortal human being who is born destined to hell i get to i get to rest upon that sovereignty in other words because god is perfect good wisdom holiness and love that is sovereignty god is the fullness of all of those things and in that he is sovereign and since we know he is absolutely perfect good wisdom holiness and love and with that god is sovereign we know god's hands hand his hand was on paul this entire time so we know that Paul could not make it to Rome. He sent this letter. Praise God for this epistle. If if Paul, I, I don't know, you know, God can do whatever he wants, but I'm wondering if Paul was able to, in his own will, in his own power, make it happen, make and make that trip to Rome of his own volition. Would we ever get this letter? I don't know. I don't know. But I thank God for it. And it's inspired and breathed out by God. Thank God for it. He makes it to... Now, here's the footnote. If you guys are not familiar with the story of Paul, we're going to keep mentioning Paul because he's the author here. Now, he does make it to Rome. He makes it to Rome eventually. But not on a missionary trip, but as a prisoner sentenced to death. But why? As a Roman citizen for preaching the gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be... Well, I thought I was on mute, but I guess I'm not on mute. And that sucks. Anyway, sorry about that, guys. I'm still working out the kinks here. All right. Here we go. So, so my question to you, faithful listener, is where do you see God in the text? What does the text say about God to you? Now, here's the gospel and all this. So, continue on with the passage. So, Paul says, I am, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. What does that have to do with the gospel of God? So, just like no one else who knew Saul before he became Paul, would had even tried to bet on him becoming a Christian, we do not know where somebody, somebody is going based on where they are at now. I say this all the time, especially in the age of deconstruction, of taking wounds and hurts from other Christians and not processing that out, not taking those to the Lord, uh, let it sit and fester and dwell and let the just let the enemy do his work in you and where eventually soon you you divorce yourself from the community of God you divorce yourself from church you just like you know what I can I can I have better things to do on Sunday like nothing um where people are at now and if you're listening to this and you find yourself in the same place hey praise be to God where you're at now is not where you're going. 
where you're at now is not necessary where you're going by the grace of God. However, I'm going to submit to you that today, right now, is a good day to repent. Good day to turn away from your thoughts, your worldly, your worldly uh, philosophies, your listening to the evangelism of the world, and turn your sights and affections upon God. If you listen to the worldly wisdom, God only helps those who help themselves. You know that is not true, and it also damns us all to hell. Because while some have the strength to get themselves out of a pit, none of us are good enough, perfect enough, obedient enough, wise enough, holy enough, and loving enough to get us out of hell and into the presence of God. And I think we believe that. I think like we take a theological pop quiz. I think we do believe that. But I would say that we say we believe that, but yet our actions say something totally different. How do I know? The biggest way... The biggest way how I know this is how many Christians grew, who grew up Christian who get into the real world get kicked in the teeth by sin and Satan and just the world and are left dumbfounded that this is not how it's supposed to go. So out of that, we get two responses. Either they try harder to be better, usually tr keep trying to earn the favor of God in some way, which does not work, or run away from him and everything that he has given to us, run away from him altogether, which usually starts out in some kind of, I'm going to, I kind of miswrote this because I think both ways end up a loss of faith, a loss in, like you yeah, I have to completely break this down because the world is evangelizing that God is not this nor that or this or that. He is not good. He is not sovereign. He is not gracious. He's not perfect and forgiving. He's a hard taskmaster. And so you need to do less with that and try to figure out what your own religion is or figure out or try to be true to yourself. You ever heard of that? And God is offering us one identity. God is offering us Christ Jesus, our Lord, putting our identity in him. Where we go off the rails, where we are led astray is when we try to identify for something not God. Here's the good news. Despite all of that, is that the salvation from sin and death and unto God, who is perfectly wise, love, and peace, does not depend on, as the Apostle John puts it, of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but it depends completely and perfectly by God. So out of that good news, here there may be two, one or two possible reactions that are brewing up in you. If God is completely sovereign and I'm saved by God and I have nothing to do with it, well, there's nothing that I can really do. I'm just going to let let life just happen to me. I'm just going to go ahead and just peruse through life. Well, that's hogwash. The Apostle John will go on to say in a few in a couple of chapters later, the one who believes in the Son of God has eternal life, but the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. You, just like every human ever born of a woman, are called by God to put their trust and obey him who is the only living God. Amen and amen. And then here's the other reaction. You have that reaction. There's nothing I can do. That's one path. The other path is... God gives you a new heart with new desires, okay? I think it is after you have seen what your sin has done to your life and the lives around you, then God rescues you, grants you his own heart and his spirit, cause you to follow his statutes and carefully observe his ordinances and gives you the grace and the sheer gift of repentance. It is only then we can sincerely speak the words of Peter when Christ asked him, do you want to go away as well? John 6, starting at verse 68. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So here we go. 
What's our responsibility into all this? Stop turning away from God. If you're now away from God, or when you too turn away, here's the simple thing. Turn right back to him. That's it. Keep confessing. Keep confessing your sins. Keep complaining to God. I just saw a quote uh, the other day across my Instagrams. There's a difference between, there's two types of complaints. There's a holy complaint that when we complain to God, and there's a discontent complaint when we complain about God. What are you doing? This is your good father in heaven. Why don't you run to him and ask him what's going on? Why don't you go to him and take your hurts and your pains and your sins and throw those upon God and let him join you. Let him comfort you. Let him sit with you and be with you. Listen, repent. repentance is to live differently. Now, will you fail and struggle and suffer? I can almost promise you, yes, you will. But all you got to do is just keep turning back to him. One of the most greatest evidences of our broken world are the human struggles with, with addiction to destructive vices like drugs and alcohol. But that's an external evidence, evidence that we can clearly see on the outside of what sin does to us on the inside. Without the grace of God, we, are go, we go headlong into sin, not counting the cost of consequence to our own life and to everyone around us. Every, have you ever met someone who has been or addicted to porn? Well, I have because that is me. I am that person. That is an addiction. And people struggle with that addiction. And sin lies to you and tells you it's harmless. No one is getting hurt by this. But you are getting hurt by that sin. And the people you are watching, the image bearers of God in those videos, are getting hurt by that sin. And if you have people close enough to you to actually see you for who you are, your relationships are being hurt by that sin. The wages of cons and wa the wages and consequences of sin is death. And just like Adam and Eve, they didn't die like instantly and thought, well, maybe I can escape punishment by covering up my shame. But because they belong to God, they were predestined, loved, called, justified, glorified by God. God wasn't going to let them go like that. God came down where they were at and he preached the gospel. And here's the good news. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Christ came down to where we are at now and preached the gospel to you and me. Here is the call. Trust in Christ. Believe in him. Just keep confessing. Keep repenting. Start letting the world become dim to you as you look into the beauty of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's my prayer for us. Lord, open our eyes, make eye contact with us, kill off our cold hearts, give us your heart with new desires for you alone. Amen. All right. So we're working through some technical te uh, difficulties, but I hope everything works out. I'm if uh, if I accidentally mute this during the recording, uh, I'll do another stream this afternoon. Uh, but I love you guys so much. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, send them in uh, and join us. In two days, we're going to do um, uh, Wednesday Pastoral Epistles at 5 p.m. Central. Later.